Good evening. Welcome to Ziggy's World. I'm Ziggy. And tonight I'm going to be interviewing Dean Thompson. And we're going to discuss the ferries and the bank that's not a bank. Uh, good evening, Dean. Do you want to uh, give us a little bit of a rundown of what, uh, what you do? Well, um, and thank you for having me, Ziggy. Uh, my name is Dean. Um, I write as a contributor for Think Scotland. Um, you can find my stuff on thinkscotland.org. I also write on a Substack, uh, deanmthompson.substack.com. And if you're really interested, I also put up YouTube on my YouTube. I put up media appearances because I'm sometimes on um, GB News. I sometimes go on podcasts. I do a bit of media talking points. Um, um, that would be what Dean M. Thompson, YouTube. So uh, opinion columnist, a sleuther. <laughs> That's who I am. <laughs> You, 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 yeah, I know, I know for a fact because we've talked before and we've done spaces on on Twitter and that uh, you're um, you you're really incredibly good at um, finding out information that uh, <laughs> that people have no idea about. So we're gonna we're gonna discuss the ferries and the bank that's not a mm. bank. First of all, the ferries. Mm. Now, Dean, where I thought, um, where are we? With the ferries at the moment, how much is the cost of these ferries so far? <laughs> well, they're, the original estimate of what ninety-seven was it million originally? We're well above that. <laughs> we're yeah. pushing well past three hundred million. So it's six what six odd years late, more easily more than double or triple the original cost by the time all is said and done. It's been a litany of. People always say, when reporting about the ferries, the, the ferry fiasco. Fiasco makes it sound like, oh, shucks, things have went wrong. But I don't know. It seems to me, I remember back in the day writing about this, I think there's potential for something worse than just, oh, shucks, it's a fiasco, it went wrong. Because back in 2015, um, was it even further back actually it was this all started of course with ferguson marine before the you know ndrf happened run up to ndrf the yard's gonna shut oh dear salmon comes in saves the yard and then it becomes a political thing for the snp heading into the few, the elections 2015 2016 was it um so this became a political thing politics ahead of any kind of pr proper rigorous process and we know in terms of Ferguson Marine, um, the bid they put forward did not meet minimum criteria. Like there was the taxpayer guarantee not included, even though it's a mandatory requirement. How on earth that happened, I would love to know one day. And <laughs> they seem to have an insider track with their bid back originally. The other competitors did not have. And so there's a lot going on there that one day will eventually have to come out. But taxpayers have been the poorer for it, and our island communities have suffered because of it. Do you believe there's been, I've used the word corruption, or at least uh, some uh, Ill illegal activities going on surrounding the ferries? Well, the awarding originally, the original awarding of the contract certainly. And of course, this is not just me, opinion writer on Think Scotland, doing a column on it. BBC have been reporting on this. I mean, it's out there. There are legitimate questions and there is the allegations of potential wrongdoing in terms of how the contract ended up being awarded to Ferguson Marine when they could not offer the taxpayer refund guarantee they were that was not available they could not offer that ferguson said they couldn't offer it how they ended up with the contract i don't know and there are questions that will need to be answered about that i'm sure people <laughs> will all have reasonable explanations one day <laughs> yeah with the, the latest report i've seen is the the, the wages has been what is it 3.2 million uh, spent on wages which uh, without even captains of the, the ferries, because you need to have them in place six months before they 
uh, going to service, uh, being paid um, a lot, a lot, thousands and thousands of pounds. This is taxpayers' money, isn't it? It's an yep. absolute, you know, it, it's, it's an absolute scandal. You can go down the list. I mean, at one point, the Scottish government even, of course, they nationalised the yard, and then they bring in the fixer to turn up the turn it around expert. He gets paid what over a million pounds, and he doesn't turn anything around. I mean, this is it's just a litany of disaster. And I mean, when you drill into the details of it, though, it get, what really gets my back up is there's absolutely no learning curve here. I mean, because the LNG is a good case in point. Like you have a situation where the ferries are built, the wrong L, the wrong wrong piping for the LNG. How that can happen? Again, gets back to the original award for the contract. Was it really something this particular yard was able to do on, on vessels of this scale? And now we know the Scottish government's finally admitted. Where is my note? Yeah, in regards to the liquefied natural gas, which is how these vessels, what well, the Glen Ross and the Glen Sanex, they'll be powered by the LNG, and that'll be to lower cut emissions, lower diesel. Everyone's a winner. Great for the environment, except the Scottish government has no clue about when the LNG tanks will be built in Ardrossan. They've got no idea when they'll come online for the vessels. So at the moment, the LNG gets transported 6,000 plus miles from Qatar in the middle in the Persian Gulf on a ship to Dover, and then it's going to be in diesel vans, trucked up all the way to Trin. <laughs> How the heck that is good for the planet and net zero, I don't know. It's, so, another, it's another one of those, uh, like the wind turbines, isn't it? Uh, great for the environment, but they run on diesel and, um, <laughs> you know, it's, 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 and oil and diesel is used all the time in them. So it, it's another one of these People call it the environmental scam, which... It's, I mean, at a certain point, you have to think, I mean, the, the vessels have been delayed six years. So how can they not have the LNG tank facilities built in our draws? Yeah. And it's like the ports as well, isn't it? Why are the, port, the ports can't take the ferries if they were ready to lower well, or that's the whole other thing with our dross and harbour. Um, that's a whole fight. Um, but I do think, I do want to note for the audience, 26th of February, Fiona Hislop, Transport Secretary, old one and new one, post and pre-Hamza and John Swinney. Um, she said in 26th of February, Calmac currently expects that there will be two tankers per week, per vessel, that's four tankers every week, going up from Dover all the way up to Scotland just to operate these ferries, should they eventually maybe one day perhaps come online. So, yeah, it's quite something. Yeah, it, it's, it, it, it's especially when you see the likes of Turkey who got an order, was it two years ago, and it's already finished, done, uh, operational within... Mm -hmm within two years, we were meant to be the um, the leading experts within Europe on building ships and ferries. So, you know, is it just, is it just this one um, company that's just not f fit for purpose or is it the whole industry that needs looking at? I don't think it's the whole industry because if you go down to BAE systems they can they can yeah. build the destroyers for the Royal Navy no bother yeah. so there's it's not a question of that it's the, the issue is 2014 this yard was going out of business the last of the one on the Clyde side red Clyde side politically it would be embarrassing so Salmon made a point of saying SNP will save it vote independence and then the some people lumbered with that and of course the new ownership private ownership that was brought in to buy over the yard fmel and all of that of course this is someone who had previously been tapped on the shoulder by salmon for other over the years um to invest in failing industries which is fine as long as it goes well and you know what you're doing but when that didn't work out you know this uh, the issue it became in 2015 the awarding of these 
ferry contracts to this uh, ferry, the, the, this ship builder. The, there were legitimate questions way back in 2015. We saw it with the original con procurement process, the concerns over the, technolog the technical skill and know-how to build vessels of this size. They didn't have the prior experience doing it. Questions over the infrastructure at the yard. The, financially, they could not give a taxpayer refund guarantee should there be delays, which is why we're on the hook subsequently. So this all goes back to a botched procurement process in regards specifically to Ferguson Marine that has the undertones of the SMPs prioritizing politics over due diligence. They didn't bother with diligence. They cared more about 2014, save the yard before the NDRF. 2015, 2016, elections coming up, make sure the yard doesn't shut down. That bring in the private owner and then eventually nationalization. Keep it going, keep the jobs, you know. SNP, Glasgow's important for that, has become politically important for the SNP in Scotland. Uh, so I think there's a lot of politics with it, sadly. Do you, last question on the ferries then. What do you think they are going to see any passengers get on, the, on board? Get any what, sorry, on board? The passengers will eventually oh, get when they'll come online. Well, I have no idea. <laughs> because you need to remember, you've got the whole Ardross and Harbour situation, which is, um, you mentioned the harbour. Because I remember doing a bit of re research for a future article. And now, right now, you have a situation where the Scottish government and Peelport, who own Ardrossan, and they also own Clyde... Uh, Clyde, Clyde side more generally is it Clyde side? Yeah, um, they own the facilities and the pri unusual the private owner to own these sort of ship facilities in the, the harbour. You've got um, Calmac saying our Drossen is not fit for purpose. Red Peelport say it's safe and effective. Any damage is caused by Calmac. Scottish government say we need to upgrade and invest this anyway for these new ferries. And Peelport says the Scottish government should pay for that. The Scottish government says, no, you're private owners, you pay for it. And nothing's been done after six years because nobody wants to take responsibility. So at the moment, they'll probably be operating out of Trin yeah, until whatever happens with Adrossen. More complicated, the SNP did government by press release, as is their want. Um, no plan, press release only. Um, they said, we guarantee that the ships will continue to operate out of Ardrossan Harbour, um, but we're not going to pay to upgrade the facilities. <laughs> so nothing's happening, nothing's moving forward, you know, so God knows, maybe the ferries will be able to sail eventually, but Ardrossan Harbour and all the harbours more generally, there's not any work on, nobody's taking responsibility for any of that. No, and I'll, no doubt they'll be uh, out of date by the time they, uh, <laughs> they get here. So we'll move on now to this bank that's not a bank. Yes. I've been doing a lot of digging on this. You, you have. You, you've been excellent. I do know uh, for a fact that you've been excellent in digging into this. Mm. Now, how much How much is in? Do, do we know how much money is actually in this bank now? Um, billions of pounds. What was it? The taxpayer monies over the first 10 year period will be in the billions, but it goes in over the course of the first 10 years of the bank. So we are talking a lot of taxpayers money here. Um, and the, the biggest issue I have with it recurring is the section 29 of the SNI, the Scottish National Investment Bank, the SNIB Act in 2020, years ago now, was that there would be an oversight board established to, which would do the forensic oversight of the how the SNIB is investing, spending huge volumes of taxpayers' money, you know, quality of investments, internal procedures, because the Scottish government ministers do, to be fair to them, have a day job. They don't have the time, and in all likelihood, many of them don't have the expertise, in all frankly, frank sincerity, to, come to do this kind of forensic oversight. And the, in the absence of this, this oversight advisory board, Harry Clinch at Disruption Banking and myself at 
my sub stack and also think Scotland. We've been digging up more and more examples where there is the potential, not saying there is, just the potential for conflicts of interest and all sorts of things that really because will all, continue all, to be raised until we get that board. All, all the directors of this bank are, are government ministers, aren't they? Well, the Scottish National Investment Bank is not like a high street bank. No. Yeah, it is. It's a state-owned asset. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the Scottish, this it is accountable to the taxpayers via this advisory board that doesn't exist. So in the absence of that, straight to Scottish government ministers. Where's the, the reason that, who, who, who oversee, who, where's the independent oversight into the bank? Is there, is there any financial independent oversight into it? The advisory board is the oversight and it doesn't exist. So there isn't at the moment, there isn't any... Well, there's, if you trust the Scottish government ministers, I mean, I have asked, um, Scottish government ministers have said um, to me that, um, what was it, Neil Gray in the 15th of November last year said, um, in regards to this kind of stuff, uh, details such as membership, recruitment, appointments process, remuneration, frequency of meetings of the advisory board will be updated in 2024. That update never came. And so pressed again and we do keep getting the runaround with this because we also get told that um neil gray again and this was 29th of december last year said that he does meet with the snib to get provide oversight and to keep an eye on it he said quote scott gov routinely discusses the range of matters with the bank including its approach to governance risk procedures managing conflicts of interest, banks, investments decisions overseen by the investment committee who rigorously objectively assess each business case in the commercial interest court. So, which is good to know that the Scottish government have said, we have been asking these questions, which makes me wonder, have they? And if you have, what are the answers? I mean, if you want me to run down the reason why I'm being used, by Neil Gray's answer. Um, I can point out, for example, in the absence of the advisory board, Harry Clinton and myself have found examples of the need for oversight. £7.5 million of taxpayers' money was lent by the SNIB to a company run by the brother of an SIB employee. There could be very well be a good answer to that. I would just like to know the answer to that. Nine million pounds in circularity, the DRS tobacco with Lorna Slater. Nine million pounds, most of that is lost. The head honchos at the SNIB say they hope, quote, hope, not all nine million will be lost. Five million pounds of our money was invested in a firm partly owned by an SNIB director. Um, so there's all this kind of stuff. And I would just think that Neil Gray, has Neil Gray been asking the snib leadership like at alec dunham al dunham has he, he has he sat down with neil gray government ministers has and it, it went through this i don't believe so if they have i've never heard it seen any record of it any any suggestion other than that one message on the 29th of the december last year claiming that he did i mean so it is alarming it, it is a serious issue here i mean if we can keep, if I, do you want me to keep going on about this? Yeah, no, no, no. I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah. Can, can I can go because the whole DRS thing is really fascinating the, to me. The, 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 the issue that I have that I've mm. had since this began, which since this was uh, started, is uh, investment banks, mm. so to say, uh, it is always high. High, uh, the, 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 the idea is high risk, high reward. Yeah, yeah. Now, it is taxpayers' money you're gambling with, basically. Mm -hmm. it, what it is, it's taxpayers' money you're gambling with. Mm -hmm. And the record of uh, these people being good enough to put them into high risk that gets the high yeah. rewards are not mm -hmm. very good. So we, mm -hmm. are, we are gambling millions and millions and millions of pounds, potentially yeah. billions of pounds on people that are not fit to uh, to be able to gamble that money. And it's taxpayers' money. 
especially when we have a 1.5 billion black hole in public services. Yes. This money can go to uh, hospitals or mm -hmm. education and things like that. Well, and I mean, in the returns, I think the first year they made a loss, didn't they? The, the, um, yeah, they're, they're, they, I did notice, and I wrote a big piece um, on the Substack, uh, what, I think last year, uh, about because I saw they did a big whole big page advertisement blitz in the Scotsman and a couple of other newspapers. And the SNIB were saying, I'll quote, I, what was it? As we approach our third anniversary, a lot have, has been achieved for a startup. And we have even ever more clarity about the positive difference we can make. We have made 29 investments committing over 460 million pounds of our own capital, actually taxpayers' capital, but hey, let's not be pedantic, which has turned, <laughs> enabled a return of seven, so 750 million pounds uh, for uh, us and other investors. So 1.2 billion committed it to the Scottish economy in three years. Now, that's what their advertisement was boasting of. But, you know, that 460 million investment that they're boasting of uh, by the SNIB, the return on that, 2%, which is less than a current account, which a commercial bank offers savings of 5%. So you'd be better off having left the that four hundred sixty million pounds of taxpayers' money in a in a current a commercial current account and got a five percent return rather than the two percent. So, of course, let's be fair. SNIB is strategic long term investments. You don't expect in big returns right away. High risk, high reward, like you said. But, but I would you, expect something more than two percent. But return. we need the, the big issue I have. See that that's the issue I have. This is we have. A devolved uh, government, call it a government, I call it administration. You are meant to be looking after our public services. This is not in the scope of money that should be used, mm -hmm. uh, taxpayers' money that should be used. It should be used. Uh, I actually think this is outside of devolution, and it should be. It, it, it shouldn't be allowed because that is taxpayers' money that. We are desperately need for our local services. Whether they make money or not, is that then being passed on to? Uh, is it staying in the bank, and uh, you know, is it staying in that bank for future? Um, oh, um, I I am actually I I'm, I do actually agree with the idea of a national investment bank. It's one of the very few pro-business things that SMP have done. In office, so I don't, I, I don't actually want to criticise the SNIB existing. Um, I think it's important to make strategic investments that will help the long-term economy. It's sort of trying to channel investment to Scottish startups. It's a good idea, but my worry is what the heck have SNIB been investing in? And this gets to the issue of there's no advisory board, so there's a question of a lack of independence right now for this bank. Because, and it is a real thing, because if I, for example, talk about the DRS, nine million pounds, remember, was, has basically been lost with the SNIB investing in circularity Scotland for the deposit return scheme. Now, it's really weird because in regards to that, we had a weird situation where other private banks, several private banks, were also going to invest in the deposit return scheme. They waited until the legality issue with the UK Internal Market Act was clarified. SNIB didn't. They dived straight on in with nine million loan, which is now they hope not all been lost. So this does raise questions about the independence of it. Now Al Al done it. Then on the SNIB chief exec, he did go up to Holyrood and did, did say what was it? Um, uh, quote. Holyrood Acts of Parliament, this is devastating to the quality, integrity of Holyrood and devolution. Holyrood Acts of Parliament, quote, should, quote, no longer be viewed as a reliable mitigant to risk. So the Holyrood Parliament passes something, says to banks, you should invest this way, we've passed this law, this is what we want you to do. The CEO, the chief, well, the chief exec of the SNIB, Scotland's National Investment Bank's basically saying, in future, in terms of risk management, we can't trust it just because Holyrood says it's legal. Yeah. How, that's pretty devastating. And yeah, it raises even more questions because when I talked to Harry Clinch at Disruption Banking about this, 
with the investment in the DRS? How did it happen? You know, because there's no advisory board. Is there some question about political interference? Now, I'm not saying there is, I'm not saying there's not, but when I interviewed Harry, Harry at Disruption Banking, the features editor there, he gave me a quote and he said, um, the timeline show, would indicate a worrying loss of independence. Uh, quote, given this was a flagship scheme, deposit recycle, DRS, of the Greens and the SNP in the Scottish Parliament, many suspect there were potential political as well as commercial motivations at play for the 9 million being loaned out without the legality being sought, of course. The SNP have denied this, of course. We won't have them found to be political motivations. But the Times did a piece a couple of months ago, which they obtained under freedom of information. I also reported on that. Um, found that Nicola Sturgeon, at the time First Minister, actually personally intervened in the process of SNIB, the 9 million uh, and all of that. So I will just yeah, leave exactly. others to draw their conclusions from that. We, we need a good story to come out. We need uh, a, 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 an investment suit. So we need we need this to uh, to come out. And, and we, need the, we need the oversight board to be yeah. set up. Oh, definitely, one hundred percent. It needs one hundred percent because yeah. you cannot trust uh, this government with with anything. So uh, certainly not billions of pounds of taxpayers' money hidden mm -hmm. in a investment bank that nobody really, apart from you know yourself, you know yourself, when you've done all your digging, uh, uh, gets to know about the general public. Really, don't get to know about uh, what's going on with that. Because I did hear that the bottle scheme, the nine million, mm -hmm. uh, th there was something like there was a report come out that said that the they're hoping to get a million pounds of it back. A million pounds. Yeah, yeah. they um, hope okay, um, yeah. that. Uh, that a million pounds was being very optimistic. Yeah, the, the quote, I, mean, I remember watching that. It was the time, because obviously they were dragged up to Hollywood to, to, you know, to, with the committees to answer for what they've been up to. And yeah, that was um, chairman, was it the chairman, I forget, yeah. who said hope, you know. Oh. And so he's hoping they get, they don't lose all of it. And the chief exec Al Denham is saying, "Oh, Oshuk's naivety. We 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 thought risk management was fit copper bottomed because Holyrood was passing a law to say it's fine." Which you know, incidentally, to, I can kind of understand the naivety to an extent. If you're a national investment bank, Scottish government saying this law has been has been passed, we want you to loan to set up the deposit recycle. Other countries have a deposit recycle scheme. It's not the most absurd thing in the world. It's not like reinventing the wheel, but apparently it was beyond the Scottish government. And so being in that position, I can kind of understand them taking a certain view of risk management. The question really becomes, why did the SNIB make the 9 million, take that naive view, being generous with naivety is the assumption, when several private banks did not invest? I uh, waited for the... UK Internal Market Act issue to be clarified. I and again, the absence of the advisory board questions about the independence of the SNIB from politics and political decision making. I think the answer to that, Dean, is um, they get out a free card that they have with uh, mm -hmm. with this and with everything else they do. It's, yeah. uh, well, um, it was going ahead. Westminster blocked it. Uh, that's not our fault. It's Westminster's fault. So that must be again it's Westminster's fault that that will be their get out of get out of jail free card that they will use and you know they've used it they're using it even today I've heard where they're talking about um the bottle scheme because that's come up again with a question from uh, Fergus Ewing in Parliament and it's a uh, all we've all I've seen on Twitter all days the greens and uh, the SMP coming out with well, you know, this scheme was going to be world-leading, fantastic scheme, uh, but Westminster didn't want us to succeed, so they blocked it. That which is not which is not accurate, incidentally. Yeah. It's not, it's it's at all. Disaster! It was a disastrous scheme. It, it, that is why all the private companies waited for the legality of it because they knew. Mm. I know for a fact five five mm. 
supermarkets, the big mm. supermarkets, all wrote to um, uh, Hums, uh, Sturgeon, I think it was at the time, wasn't it? Mm. All wrote yeah. to Sturgeon and said, this scheme is unworkable, it needs binned, we need starting mm. again. It's a disaster. All <laughs> in a joint letter wrote to mm. Sturgeon. So why, like you said, why would they then make that £9 million investment knowing mm that it is unworkable and that yeah. there was a 90% chance Westminster was going to step in and say no. So well, why, why do it? It's, well, you need to, the timeline is in, with DRS is important because there is the unaddressed issue of did Lorna Slater, when she was a Scottish government minister, mislead Hollywood? Because remember February 2023, what was it, February, February 9th, she told MSPs, in a, in a, she wrote in a letter to MSPs that the deposit quote the deposit return scheme for Scotland regulations was approved by the Scottish Parliament in 2020 and wholly within devolved competence. Now that's what she said, and that's interesting because February 23rd, 2023, so a couple of a couple of weeks later, the same month last year in February, the Secretary of State for Scotland asked the Jack told the Commons. Um, that we have not been asked for an exemption no. under the rules of the UK Internal Market Act, and there's no been a request for one for plastics no. or anything so, or bottles. So that makes me think the Scottish, well, how I think, and I, this is just my own theory. At a meeting at some point, Lorna Slater and the Scottish government ministers, probably sitting down with Alistair Jack or something, probably mentioned in passing during a wider meeting, we'll probably need to request uh, an exemption about plastics or something. Yeah, yeah, you, you, when you, you probably will, you need to ask us for it in all likelihood. And then they move on and talk about something else. And the Scottish Greens thought, oh, we, we said we'd need an exemption. And then, and it, there's a difference between me saying, in I think I might need to go to the hospital and phoning an ambulance it's different for me saying i think I, I if i phoned an ambulance said i think i might need to go to the hospital some point later this week it's not the same as me phoning and saying yeah i need to go to the hospital <laughs> it's yeah. not the same saying i think i might need to ask for an exemption maybe isn't okay. it's not the same as official document exactly. Secretary of scotland we need an exemption on points a b c they didn't ask and especially when you're dealing in uh, a, a government level, everything has to be done officially on the record, paperwork, everything. You can't do it in a side meeting and say, yeah. well, hey, mate, we'll, um, okay for an exemption? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It seems very much like yeah. you just... You, you would, you know, there's no legality within that and government don't work like that anyway that you know it has to be done you can't do it you can't suddenly go to alistair jack four or five months later and say did mm. you okay this in the meet in uh, in the side meeting with lorna mm. slater and jack goes i think i might have done actually that can't mm. that's not possible that you, you mm. don't run government like that so you know that's we've been here before because i remember was that um i wrote uh, civil an article civil service paper trails and that was about um a cup what was that about i can't remember was it the ferry fiasco or, or was it something else because there's been so many scandals now but one of the, i remember the whole point of it was um yes it was about the ferries actually because and i was writing about the civil service which really do need more accountability. We really need more accountability here for oh, itself. Yeah. How it's meant to work. Every I is dotted, every T is crossed. Anyone with any any it's everyone's CC'd copied in to any email blockchain, if it might be in their purview. A because you don't want to step on departmental toes bureaucratically. B, you cover your bahuki. It's how the civil service meant to work. Everything in triplicate. Everyone copied in. Everything's above board. I've covered my own ass. It's not my responsibility if the SIH T hits the fan. Not with the fairies. No, no. And it's remarkable. And that opens up a whole other conversation about um the 
proximity the civil service in Scotland have to the SNP as a political party at this point. Yeah. So but that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> that is a conversation I think we can have again when we uh, when we um, do another uh, chat interview. I think um, it's been it's been really interesting as usual, Dean. Uh, keep <laughs> up the excellent work that you do behind the scenes, uh, investigating all these because it's because of people like you that we get to hear the information. Uh, and what's going on because if it wasn't for people like you uh, we would never know anything that was you know the, these kind of things because mm -hmm. it is extremely important that this gets out and people start listening to what is actually going on because at the end of the day it is our money yeah. our taxes yeah. that are being uh, mismanaged mm -hmm. wasted uh gone and uh during times of difficulties like we have seen over the last couple of years as as a country as a whole i'm not mm -hmm. talking about here just the whole of the uk it's vitally important that we get our money's worth uh, <laughs> uh yeah spent on our, our public services spent on the country and not wasted so i do thank you for the the work that you do i know it's it's fantastic so thank you for that um, I would just add, plug, give myself a plug then. Um, yeah. If you, uh, you can all, people can always subscribe for free if they wish at dnmthompson.substack.com or on my YouTube, dnmthompson on YouTube. Always welcome subscribers, followers. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dean. Uh, I'll, um, it's uh, so please do follow Dean and do follow me. And if you'd like the video, thumbs up uh subscribe and share they're the three things that you can do to help the reach of the channel so uh thank you for listening and thank you dean for coming on uh we, we will definitely speak again uh so um until next time have a great evening and we'll speak again soon <laughs>